Good evening. Uh, it's nice to see a full room, uh, and I'm happy to welcome those of you who are, are joining us in person, uh, as well as all the people who are joining us online. Uh, I'm Gavin Cleesby, the Director of Programs, Exhibitions, and Community Partnerships for the Massachusetts Historical Society, uh, and I'm happy to say that we have a great program uh, for you this evening. Uh, we will hear about forgotten heroes of the American Revolution. Uh, nearly 2,000 privately owned vessels uh, set sail as American privateers during the Revolution. They captured British merchant marine ships, uh, disrupting flows of supplies, uh, and attacked uh, ships of war. Uh, in the end, privateers captured around 1,800 British ships, uh, greatly aiding the work of the very, very small uh, U.S. Navy. Navy. Uh, our speaker tonight, uh, Eric J. Dolan, uh, is the author of 14 books. His most recent is uh, A Furious Sky, the 500-year history of America's hurricanes, which received a number of accolades. Other books include Leviathan, the history of whaling in America, and Black Flag's Blue Waters, the epic history of America's most notorious pirate. He is a graduate of Brown, Yale, and MIT, where he received a PhD in environmental policy. Uh, he lives in Marblehead, Massachusetts with his family. Uh, for anyone who may be joining MHS for the first time, the Massachusetts Historical Society is the first historical society in America. We date back to 1791, and we have been an independent nonprofit organization for the past 230 years. We maintain an amazing research library, which we make available to the public for free. Uh, it holds close to 14 million manuscript pages, uh, including the papers of three of the first six U.S. presidents. Uh, we host a wide variety of programs. We're only able to host programs like these thanks, thanks to the support of our members and donors. We hope you'll return for future events, and we hope you'll support our work by becoming a member or making a donation. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Eric J. Dolan. Thank you very much, Gavin, for that wonderful introduction. Thanks to all of you for coming out tonight. I really appreciate it. The Massachusetts Historical Society has a dear place in my heart. I've researched a few of my books here. I remember spending long hours downstairs uh, reading old documents. And I've also donated, I think, about 120 or 130 books to the society. <laughs> not, not my own books, you know, books I, I used for for researching. But uh, anyway, good to be back. And uh, thanks to all those people who are watching from afar. It was late in the day on June 3rd, 1780, when Salem Captain Jonathan Harridan and his privateer Pickering were heading for the friendly port of Bilbao, Spain. The British privateer Achilles, however, was standing in the way. Nobody would have faulted Harridan had he fled in the face of a superior foe. While the Pickering had a crew of 38 men and 16 cannons, the Achilles had a crew of 130 men and 43 cannons. Hardly a fair fight, but that's not how Harridan saw it. He relished the chance to confront the enemy and strike a blow for the revolutionary cause. Turning to the British prisoner who had informed him of the Achilles' might, Harridan said, I shan't run from her, and he didn't. As the Achilles began its approach, Harridan told his men that though the Achilles appeared to be superior to them in force, he had no doubt that they should beat her off if they were firm and steady and did not throw away their fire. Meanwhile, in Bilbao, word quickly spread that there was about to be an epic battle just offshore between an American ship and a British ship, and a thousand people rushed to the beach to watch the spectacle. Booming broadsides and musket fire filled the air. One of Harridan's crew said that while shot flew around him, Harridan was as calm and steady as amidst a shower of snowflakes. The battle raged for more than two hours, and then Harridan told his men to load the cannons with bar shot, which is basically a cannon, a cannonball cut in half with each half affixed to the end of an iron bar. And when that comes out of a cannon, it starts spinning wildly and it could slash rigging and sails and even smash a spar or a mast if it hits it directly head on and the 
Achilles uh, was gravely damaged by this and decided to turn and flee from the scene. Harridan chased for a while, but despite the Achilles injuries, it was still too fast for Harridan to catch up. So he spun about and he reclaimed the Golden Eagle, which is a British merchant ship that Harridan had captured earlier that the Achilles had briefly reclaimed. All told, one of Harridan's men had been killed. His head was completely sheared off by a cannonball, and eight men were seriously wounded. Now, I want to tell you a story about this plaque. This is the upper third of a plaque that was placed in Salem, Massachusetts in 1909 by the Sons of the American Revolution. And while I was working on the book, I read about the existence of this plaque, and it said that it was on the side of a house in Salem where Harridan had once lived. And if you're familiar with Salem, you probably know the witch house, that black house in that intersection, right where there used to be a Jerry's Army and Navy. That's where this plaque was supposed to be. So I live in Marblehead, which is right next to Salem. So I hopped on my bike and I rode over there and I assiduously looked for this plaque. I looked at every single house in the neighborhood. I found a bunch of historic plaques, but I did not find this one. So I rode back home a little bit discouraged, and I called a local historian of Salem, and I asked her, where is that plaque? And she laughed and she said, well, it's down the street in a Korean barbecue restaurant. <laughs> so, so I got back on my bike. Remember, this is the height of COVID. I rode back to the restaurant. I walked in and the woman who was there was so excited to see me because she didn't have a single customer and she thought I was there to buy some food. But unfortunately, I told her I should have bought some food in hindsight. But I said, no, I'm here to look at that plaque, which was behind her head on the wall in this restaurant. Nobody has any idea how it ended up in that restaurant. But I think it's emblematic of the way that American privateering history has been treated, sort of shunted aside. Now, Harridan remained in Bilbao for two months. And on the way back across the Atlantic, back to Salem, he captured three more British prizes, which were sent into the town. To honor their intrepid captain, the owners of the Pickering gave him this beautiful tankard, which is inscribed with his initials and a profile of the Pickering and two identical mugs. And this is in the collection of the Peabody Essex Museum. And I have to tell you an embarrassing story. My wife, Jennifer, she only agrees to come to one of my talks for each one of my books that come out, that comes out. This is my 15th book. And except she makes two exceptions. If I go to Martha's Vineyard in Nantucket, which I've been lucky enough to do for almost every book, she comes with me. <laughs> but my, the, first, the first talk I gave this year, one of the earliest talks that she came to was in Newburyport. And I showed this slide and I mentioned that it was owned by the Peabody Essex Museum because we were near Salem. And then I mentioned also that I married my wife in the Peabody Essex Museum in the East India Hall. We were either the first or second wedding ever held there. Now it's a huge industry. Um, but I couldn't remember the year that we were married. <laughs> I, I couldn't remember it was 1994 or 1995. So I, I fumbled around and I just have to tell you that my wife was not particularly amused by that story, but anyway. Okay, uh, during his tenure in the Massachusetts Navy and as a privateer, Harridan took uh, many prizes. He captured hundreds of British cannons and an equal number of British prisoners. He died of tuberculosis at the age of 59 in 1803, and the local paper, the Salem Gazette, lauded him as one of the most able and valiant commanders that the revolution had produced. Now, the Pickering was one of nearly 2,000 American privateers during the war, and Harridan was one of probably 30 to 40,000 privateersmen who worked and fought on those ships. Privateers were armed vessels owned and outfitted by private individuals that were given government permission to attack enemy ships during times of war. That permission came in the form of a letter of mark, which was a formal legal document that gave the 
owner of that a document the right to attack belligerent ships, return them to a local port where a court of vice admiralty would determine whether or not it was a legitimate prize. And if it was, the proceeds from the auction of the cargo of the captured ship and the ship itself would be split evenly between the owners and the investors in the privateer and the men who were on the privateer. So it was sort of like a way to have a cost-free Navy or a militia of the sea. Now, despite the contributions made by Harridan and tens of thousands of other men like him, privateering has often been given short shrift in histories of the American Revolution, and I think even more criminally in maritime histories of the American Revolution. Whoops. Rebels at Sea fills the void by offering a comprehensive account of privateering that demonstrates they were critical to winning the war. American privateersmen took the maritime fight to the British and made them bleed in countless daring actions against British merchant ships and not a few military ships. They caused maritime insurance rights in Britain to rise precipitously. They diverted critical British resources to protecting British merchant ships and to attacking privateers. They made many in Britain, particularly merchants, weary of this long, never-ending war, and they played a starring role in bringing France into the, Amer into the war on the side of the Americans. On the domestic front, privateering brought much-needed goods and military supplies into the country. They provided cash infusions for the war effort, boosted coastal economies through the outfitting and sailing and manning of the privateers, and most importantly, maybe not most importantly, but very importantly, bolstered Americans' confidence that this quixotic war against what was by far the most powerful nation in the world might actually succeed. Thousands of books have approached the revolution from virtually every single angle. Rebels at Sea places privateersmen at the very center of the war effort. It demonstrates that when the United States was only a tenuous idea, they stepped forward and risked their lives to help make it a reality. And when I say thousands of books have been written about the American Revolution, you know what I'm talking about. It is amazing. I read a statistic the other day that said more than 16,000 books have been written about Abraham Lincoln alone. So it gave me a little bit of pause, but the only thing that kept me going is I don't think there have been enough good books about privateering during the Revolution. Now, in fighting against the British on the seas, the Americans relied on four maritime forces. There were state navies, Washington's secret navy, which operated only about a year after the beginning of the conflict, the Continental Navy, and privateers. And of these four, privateers were by far the most numerous and effective fighting force. They captured somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,600 to 1,800 British ships that were worth many millions of pounds. Massachusetts likes to be the first in things, and they were the first in privateering. They passed the first privateering act on November 1st, 1775, and I was honored by Peter Drummy, the librarian here. He put together a wonderful little exhibit that, that shows some of the documents that I talk about in the beginning of the book that relate to the seminal role of Massachusetts in privateering. Now, the uh, importance of the Massachusetts Privateering Act in unleashing the privateering impulse throughout the colonies only became really apparent in hindsight. About 40 years after the end of the war, John Adams would write of that act and the passage of the Massachusetts Act. He said it was one of the most important documents in history. The Declaration of Independence is a trifle of Brimborion in comparison to it. Now, I would agree that during the war that was actually true. I would say that since then, I would put the Declaration of Independence a little bit higher in our estimation. Now, New Hampshire and Rhode Island followed suit in early 1776 with their own privateering statutes. At the same time, pressure was growing on the Continental Congress 
to expand privateering throughout all of the colonies and not have it be a piecemeal colony by colony effort. Oh, oh sorry. They, uh, they followed through on that on March 23rd of 1776 when Congress passed the privateering resolution into law. Now, with their capital tied up the docks, ship owners eagerly pursued privateering. Prizes brought in provided goods that they could sell uh, or that could be purchased, and they provided ships that could be sold. Now, Elias Haskett Derby, those of you who are familiar with local history, know that he is the one who, after uh, Derby Wharf is named in Salem, he also is purported to be the first American millionaire, or, although I think John Jacob Astor and Stephen Gerard uh, give him a run for his money. Now, many men invested in privateers. Indeed, there was a speculative frenzy that rippled across the colonies, uh, sort of like, maybe not exactly, the, uh, whoops, uh-oh. Sorry, we, we've gotten a green, a very green George Washington. I don't know what I did, but I will, uh, oh, there, it's better. Sorry, George, I'm very, very sorry. But there was a speculative frenzy that ran across the colonies, sort of like the Bitcoin frenzy that attacked us a few years ago. Now, among the more illustrious spectators was General George Washington and Generals Nathaniel Green and Henry Knox, as well as Paul Revere, who, uh, well, uh, there's another a story for another day. Uh, privateer captains would usually be hired directly and offered the largest number of shares in the privateer. This guy, Elias Davis Sr. Many of you have been to the Cape Ann Museum, I imagine. And if you've been there, you know that there's an historic house attached to the Cape Ann Museum that is the Elias Davis Sr. House. If you are lucky enough to get a docent tour of that house, you will see over the fireplace this beautiful painting. Now, keep in mind, I was writing this book during COVID. I signed the contract in February of 2020. My daughter, who's a literary agent in New York City, came home for almost a year and a half to work from home. My son, who was a student in Northeastern, came home. My wife came home. They were all home. And I have to tell you, they were the worst coworkers I have ever had. And, and they, they hated it when I referred to them as coworkers. And the problem was, I like to take a lot of breaks. I work pretty intensely. But I'd take breaks and I would go into the other rooms and I'd want to chat with them. They didn't want to talk to me. They were so busy doing their work. It was only at the end of the day that we could uh, have a conversation. But when I came upon this picture, I called my daughter, Lily, who was single at the time, she still is, into my office because she'd only read one of my books before on pirates. And I said, Lily, take a good look at this guy. He's a privateer captain. And Lily took a good long look at Elias and she said, you know, Dad, I could really get into privateering. <laughs> so, and she actually did read my book, so it worked. Now, while crewmen were sometimes known by the owners prior to being hired, in most cases they were not. And they had to be lured in, although they didn't really have to be convinced because many of them came running from the countryside to join privateers. But one of the ways that the owners got uh, people to sign on to their privateers was through something called the hearty welcome. And ads like this would appear in newspapers throughout the colonies, inviting people down to the local pub where they could drink as much as they wanted and then they would sign the articles of agreement for the privateer. Now, it's not so surprising that they drank a lot. Those of you who know colonial history know that most Americans were mildly inebriated for most of the day because they didn't trust water, which is probably a good call. Now, black men served on many privateers. One of them was James Fortin, shown here after the war. When he was just 14 and living in Philadelphia, part of an entirely free family, uh, he signed on to the Pennsylvania privateer, the Royal Lewis, captained by Stephen Decatur Sr. Fortin's job was to bring gunpowder to the cannons, and uh, the cruise was a triumph. The Royal Lewis captured seven British ships, 
which were brought back to Philadelphia, sold for a considerable amount of money, part of which he gave to his family. And uh, Fortin just narrowly missed being killed, however, because one of the cannons that he was servicing during a battle, a cannonball came through the bulwarks and killed three of the men that were next to the cannon, but he survived. He decided to try his luck again, and he signed on for another cruise on the Royal Lewis. And in hindsight, he shouldn't have been so eager because barely a day out of port, the HMS Amphion, captained by John Baisley, captured the Royal Lewis. Now, Fortin was terrified because he knew, and this was in fact true, that men of his complexion were likely to be sent to the sugar islands in the Caribbean and be sold in the slave markets. So he, sorry, one of the changes light, I wonder what's going on. Anyway, um, so he was petrified, but fortunately for him, John Baisley, the captain of the Amphion, had a 12 year old son on board. He needed a companion for his son. And for whatever reason, we don't know, he tapped Fortin. So for a number of weeks, Fortin got along famously with John Baisley's son. So when the HMS Amphion pulled into New York City, where all the men on the Royal Lewis were to be deposited on the Jersey prison ship, Baisley gave Fortin a choice. He said, you can either go to London, be a ward of my son, be free, continue to be free, have money, and get a good education, or you can be disembarked with the men of the Royal Lewis. James Fortin chose to go with the men of the Royal Lewis. He was a true patriot. And you have to understand, after the war, he is somebody who believed the ringing words of the Declaration of Independence that all men were created equal. He devoted much of his life, which ended in 1843, and when he died, he was worth $70,000. He devoted much of his life to trying to get his new country to live up to its high ideals. And in fact, one of his friends, William Lloyd Garrison, who I noticed a banner relating to the Liberator is in the room where I used to do my research. Uh, William Lloyd Garrison was a friend of James Fortin. And when he was looking for seed money for the Liberator, one of the people he tapped was James Fortin. And uh, so in a way, James Fortin helped contribute to the end that he so desperately sought during his life but was unable to realize. Now, other black men were enslaved persons who ran away from their owners to uh, gain their freedom. And then there were some owners of enslaved persons who rented out their quote unquote property as a money making venture. Now this painting is fascinating. Uh, it was owned by a urologist in Rhode Island. And for many years, it was thought to be the only known image of a black privateersman during the American Revolution. And as such, it was in much demand and was valued quite highly it was estimated to be worth $300,000. So this urologist had loaned it out to be used in many books about the American Revolution to indicate black individuals' participation in the conflict. So when the Francis Tavern in New York wanted to stage an exhibition that had that theme, they chose this painting to be the centerpiece of their exhibition. So the urologist sent the painting out to be spiffed up a little bit by a local art conservator. The local art conservator took a, uh, a legitimate solvent and started gently rubbing the hand. Off, uh oh, sorry. Off came the slide, uh, there. off came the black paint revealing a white hand underneath. It turned out that in the middle of the 20th century, somebody who realized that a unique painting of a black privateersman would be worth a lot more than a painting of a white mariner during the American Revolution painted over the skin. And he was right, because when it was found to be a forgery of sorts, its value plummeted to $3,000, and Francis Tavern decided not to use it as a centerpiece of their exhibition, and it went back to the urologist's uh, dining room, where he treated it as an old friend. And part of the way that I learned about this story is I am a friend of the urologist's son who now owns this painting. Right. 
Anyway, many have argued that privateerism were motivated more by greed than patriotism. Famed naval officer John Paul Jones, shown here, thought it was nothing but greed. A less cynical assessment views privateersmen as being motivated by a combination of profits and patriotism. And this view, I believe very strongly, is closer to the truth. The perspective of most privateersmen is best reflected in the comments by a soldier and privateersman named Christopher Prince, who looking back on his long revolutionary career wrote, through the whole course of the war, I have had two motives in view. One was the freedom of my country and the other was the luxuries of life. And George Washington, who was an astute interpreter of human motivations, agreed, and I have a number of really excellent quotes in the book from him, basically saying that nobody is going to fight any war more than a few months based on Republican virtues and patriotism alone. There has to be some remuneration. So I believe privateers were no different from the rest of the people in the country and the people that served in the Army and the Continental Navy in particular. Now, privateers experienced many triumphs and tragedies during the war. One of the most successful privateers of all was the Hulker out of Philadelphia. Over a span of four years with 11 captains, it captured 72 British prizes. During one particularly successful cruise, it captured 10 large British merchantmen, which were sold back in the docks of Philadelphia for 2 million pounds. Now, one of the worst tragedies to befall privateers during the American Revolution was something called the Penobscot Affair. It was the largest maritime force assembled during the Revolution. It consisted of 19 warships, 12 of which were privateers, and thousands of soldiers were on board those ships and other smaller transport ships that went north. Their mission was to dislodge a fort that the British were beginning to build in Penobscot Bay, right where Castine is today. It was called Fort George. The expedition sailed from Boston on July 19th, 1779. And it's important to note that part of the reason that the British wanted to establish Fort George, they wanted to have a closer base from which to launch attacks on colonial ports that were allowing so many privateers to issue forth from them. Now, poor organization and leadership and a critical delay in launching the attack led to a fiasco when on August 14th, the British Navy showed up in force at the mouth of the Penobscot Bay, including a 64-gun warship. It was a complete rout. In the end, 16 American ships were burned by their own men to keep them from falling into enemy hands, and the rest were captured or sunk. As for the men, they bolted into the woods and tried to make their way back to New Hampshire and the lower parts of Massachusetts before starving. During the battle and during this uh, pell-mell uh, rush to escape, it is estimated that perhaps as many as a few hundred Americans died. And what was even more spectacular is right before the British showed up, the American uh, military or army leader and the naval leader who were supposed to work together finally agreed on a plan of attack. So all of those American ships, all of their cannons were primed for firing. So when they set fire to their own ships, there were a lot of mighty explosions of cannons that sent shrapnel in every direction. Now, many have labeled it the most devastating naval defeat that the United States suffered up until December 7, 1941, and the attack on Pearl Harbor. Now, one of the most important things that privateers did during the American Revolution was to help bring France into the war on the side of the Americans. In the early years of the war, France allowed American privateers to use their ports in the Caribbean, such as Martinique, and on the continent, such as Dunkirk, to reprovision, sell prizes, and even take on French sailors to supplement their crews. All of this was in violation of multiple treaties that France had with Great Britain. And that, plus the damage done by the privateers, infuriated the British. 
The Continental Congress sent William Bingham to the French colony of Martinique, where a large part of his job was to extend American privateering in the Caribbean, and he succeeded brilliantly. In 1778, American privateers had already captured more than 250 British ships in the Caribbean alone, and trade to this region had plummeted by 66%. And the reason that was so important is that trade between Great Britain and its sugar islands in the Caribbean was the single greatest source of external revenue to the monarchy and the parliament. So alarming were these figures that the Earl of Suffolk urged parliament not to make them public, pointing out the impropriety of acknowledging what ought not to be acknowledged at so critical a period the weakness of the nation. Meanwhile, Benjamin Franklin, who seemed to be everywhere during the American Revolution, was in France to negotiate a formal alliance. He was convinced that privateering was helping with the American cause while at the same time uh, greatly injuring Britain. That which makes the greatest impression in our favor here, Franklin wrote, is the prodigious success of our armed ships and privateers. London's public advertiser asserted that if France continued to allow American privateers to sail from French ports, an immediate war between France and this country will be the inevitable consequence. Now, the critical turning point in the war, of course, was, uh, in getting France to ally with the Americans, was the great American victory over British general, uh, gentleman Johnny Burgoyne's army at Saratoga on October 17, 1777. Now, privateering, while not causing a sharp turn in American fortunes on its own, helped create the situation in which this great American victory could prove, could prove decisive in bringing France into the conflict. It did so by greatly increasing the enmity between France and Great Britain, and also damaging the British economy. Now, arguably, the most horrific chapter in the American Revolution and the most difficult chapter for me to write was that which focused on the British prisons, both those in Great Britain and in New York, primarily in Wallabout Bay. In both places, American privateersmen made up the bulk of the prison population. The two main prisons in Brit Britain were called Fortin and Mill Prison. And between them, they held only about 3,000 men during the entire war. The death rate in Mill and Fortin prison was between 3 and 6%, which is on par with other prisons during this era. Now, Mill and Fortin prisons were bad enough, but by far the worst experience any combatant had to confront was to spend any time on one of the 19 prison ships in New York City. During the war, between 15,000 and 22,000 men were held on these prison ships. All of the prison ships were dreadful, but the Jersey was by far the worst. Nicknamed Hell Afloat, the Jersey had been a fourth-rate 64-gun British warship. It was the largest of the British prison ships, and it held at any one time between 850 prisoners and 1,200. Just imagine that. And it was only moored about four to 500 feet from land. So the prisoners who were allowed to go up on the main deck one hour a day could see in the distance beautiful windmills, fresh water, cows grazing, and they were in hell. Now between six and 12 men died per day on the Jersey. Every morning, the British officers would yell down, rebels, bring up your dead. And not only did they have to bring up the dead, but the rebels had to hop into a rowboat and bring them to shore and bury them in shallow graves that they themselves dug. And there was a very affecting scene that I wrote about and read about of one American prisoner. He said that whenever they went to the shore, some of the men would grab tufts of grass and inhale, smell them, and pass them around because it just gave them a minor respite from the hell that they were going back to. Now, one inmate left the following damning portrait of his time on the Jersey. There are about 1,100 prisoners on board. There were no berths or seats 
to lie down on, not a bench to sit on. Many were almost without clothes. The dysentery, fever, frenzy, and despair prevailed among them and filled the place with filth, disgust, and horror. The scantiness of the allowance, the bad quality of the provisions, the brutality of the guards, and the sick pining for the comforts of they could not obtain all together furnish continually one of the greatest scenes of human distress and misery ever beheld. The number of deaths on the Jersey alone is shocking. The best estimates point to it being roughly 11,500, the vast majority of which were American privateersmen. By comparison, in the entire war, somewhere between 4,400 and 6,800 Americans died on land in the direct line of battle. Now, one of the biggest criticisms of privateers is that they siphoned valuable manpower from the Continental Navy, and that is absolutely true. Many men chose to become privateersmen instead of going into the Navy because of the prospect of potentially earning more money in a shorter time and having less, less rigid discipline uh, placed upon them. But that doesn't mean that had there been no privateers, that the Continent Continental Navy would suddenly have been transformed into a fearsome fighting force. There are only about 60 Continental Navy ships operating on the Atlantic during the war. Building and assembling a Navy from scratch would have been and would have overwhelmed a smoothly running government for the relatively inexperienced, poorly staffed, and financially strapped Continental Congress, it was an almost insurmountable challenge. Keep in mind that the Continental Congress is trying to herd cats, the 13 colonies. It was hard to get them to go in one direction, and they didn't have the uh, ability to levy taxes. So the 16 or so million dollars they spent on putting together the Continental Navy was a major percentage of their overall budget throughout the entire war. Now, the Continental Navy's record in battle is not an enviable one. 28 vessels were captured or destroyed, and many others were lost at sea, sold, returned to France, or sunk to keep them from falling into the hands of the enemy. Seems to be a theme with some of the battles. Now, at war's end, just a few Navy ships were left. There were, however, some bright spots for the American Navy. I'm not trying to trash the Continental Navy. They did some very good things, but their contribution, I think, needs to be put into perspective. Raids on the Caribbean munitions depots brought back much needed gunpowder. Navy ships did an excellent job of ferrying diplomats and papers and dispatches across the Atlantic, and they captured roughly 200 prizes. Nevertheless, in July 1780, John Adams reflected on the fortunes of the Continental Navy, writing, in looking over the long list of vessels belonging to the United States, taken and destroyed, and recollecting the whole history of the rise and progress of our Navy, it is very difficult to avoid tears. The American Revolution was the Navy's first hour, but not its finest. And I'd say I love John Adams. He, I think, even more than Benjamin Franklin, what he wrote just it had full of so much passion and honesty, and he covered so many different topics. Now, I love David McCullough. I just wish he had never written the book, John Adams, because I would have loved to have taken a crack at that. <laughs> now, if there had been no privateers, the Navy would have had an easier time recruiting officers and sailors and obtaining cannons and ammunition. There's no doubt about that. But the absence of privateers wouldn't have transformed the Navy into a force that was able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the British Navy. Congress just wouldn't have been able to get additional funding to put together a stronger Navy. And even with the Navy they had, they put it together so quickly that some of the seven frigates that they actually managed to build were build with, built with unseasoned green wood, which created its own host of problems once those ships went to sea. Now, in the absence of a powerful Navy, America relied heavily on its privateers. Under the circumstances, that was the best strategy available. And here's Boston, wonderful Boston. On the home front, privateers contributed materially to the American economy. Privateering was a great economic boon for coastal towns and cities, keeping many businesses afloat during the war and creating new ones and new fortunes. And one of the things I write about in the book was even lawyers were getting rich 
during the American Revolution, there's a great letter uh, written to a lawyer by a friend of his basically saying, you're making a mint off of all these vice admiralty cases with all these privateers being brought into, into port. And it was true. And also the money that privateersmen earned as a result of being on those ships helped them provide for their families and thereby gave an additional jolt to local economies. Each prize auction delivered a new stream of commodities into the colonies. In August of 1779, a thankful Pennsylvanian told the Continental Congress that privateers have rendered us the most essential services and brought us many articles for public and private use without which the war could hardly have been supported. Now, there was one privateer, however, who was very upset about his role in contributing to the local economy. He returned home from a cruise in February of 1779, only to discover that his hard earned savings had been depleted by his wife. He took out an ad in the local newspaper that read, whereas Elizabeth, the wife of me, the subscriber, has run me in debt while I was at sea, wasting my substance in riotous living. And as I am in danger of being further run in debt by the said Elizabeth, this is to warn all persons harboring or trusting her on my account for the future, as I will not pay one farthing from this date. Whether the marriage lasted is unknown. <laughs> the formal end of the war came on September 3rd of 1783 when the Treaty of Paris was signed. Surviving privateers were transformed into merchant ships and they played their part in transporting America's wares to distant ports, proudly flying the nation's new flag. And one of the things I have to mention, I've written 15 books, all of them except for one were on a topic I didn't know much about. The only one that I knew a lot about was about sewage treatment. And, you know, it wasn't just because I used the bathroom like everybody else, it was because when I was at MIT, my doctoral dissertation was on the cleanup of Boston Harbor. But all the other books, because I'm not a trained historian, were sort of on topics I didn't know a lot about. So it's like getting a master's degree every 18 months or two years. And one of the books was When America First Met China, which is about the American China trade. And I, I wrote about all these different American ships that opened up the China trade. It was only until I worked on this book that I suddenly realized that a lot of the ships that opened up the China trade were privateers during the American Revolution, the most famous of which was the Grand Turk out of Salem, one of Derby's ships. So just fascinating the connections that came about, uh, to me at least, in, in writing this book. Now the men who owned and financed privateers, as well as those who had chosen to fight for their country on the decks of these vessels, looked back on their accomplishments with pride and wondered, as did all Americans, what the future would bring for themselves and their new country. And before I finish up, that's the last slide, I wanna say something about COVID. I know it's a topic you all know and love, but COVID helped me write this book in a very strange way. As I said, I, uh, I signed the contract for this book in February of 2020. If you remember, the big lockdown of the country was in March of 2020. And uh, one of the things I do to research when I research books, when I use MHS, I would come and spend days here copying documents, taking pictures, writing down things. Well, one of the libraries I use very extensively is Widener Library at Harvard University, because they have some of the best databases around and they've got a lot of books. So I often spend days in there going through all sorts of stuff. For whatever reason, just a week before the national lockdown, I said, you know, I had to go in and get some background materials. I didn't know the national lockdown was coming. People weren't panicked about COVID. So I went in for two consecutive days all day, and I probably looked at more than 100 books, many of which were quite old, and I went through numerous databases like early American newspapers and British newspapers online and all these things. I must have downloaded literally hundreds of articles. And then I went home and then the lockdown occurred and Widener closed, MHS I'm sure closed, everybody closed, my local library closed. If I had not gone and gotten those probably, on, there must have been more 
well over 200 documents that I was able to call from. If I hadn't gotten those, I certainly couldn't have written the book I did. And I'm not sure I could have written the book at all. And even with that, I was helped during the COVID because early American newspapers, which is just the best source that I've ever found to get documents from the 30 newspapers that were publishing during the American Revolution, I knew there were more documents I needed to take a look at. So I contacted the company that sells the subscriptions to institutions like yourself. Well, they don't sell them to individuals. And uh, if I could come up with the money to pay what you guys pay, you know, I probably wouldn't be writing. But I'd be doing something else. But um, so they kept telling me, no, I said, I just want one week's access, one week's access. No, no, no. Well, I wouldn't give up. I kept finding out different people at the company. I finally sent an email to a vice president of the company and got on the phone with her and I convinced her. She was very nice and I thank her in the acknowledgements. She gave me a week's access to early American newspapers from my home. And I was able to get some key documents relating to battles that I had only learned about later after I've been doing research that helped me round out the book. So, and the one other thing that COVID did for me is it normally takes me about 18 months to maybe 20, 22 months sometimes to research and write a book. Because of COVID, I was home all the time. I had nothing to do. So I finished this book, and don't look down on it for this, but I finished the entire book in about 15 months. So, uh, so I have to thank COVID for, for some things, although I wish it had never happened. So with that, I am, I'm done with my talk. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. And thanks again for coming. So we ask people to use the microphone so that people online can hear the questions, but I'm sure uh, Eric would be happy to answer questions. Yeah. Oh. I think I can talk loud enough. Can you hear me? I can hear you, but I think okay. it's for the benefit of the people right. at home. Oh, like everyone can hear me? Okay, good. Uh, my question is, now you mentioned the exit of the boats from the war to the China trade. What about the entry? Were these, many of these boats reconverted merchant ships? Uh, were, were any built purposely, and in what proportion? Uh, great question. Uh, most of them, the vast majority of privateers were either former fishing vessels or merchant vessels. And as you probably know, even before the war, a lot of merchant vessels were armed with swivel guns and sometimes cannons because the ocean could be a dangerous place. But a lot of them were repurposed or reconfigured. There would be new holes struck through the hull, through one of the lower decks or through the bulwarks, and they'd add cannons and other armaments. But that's where most of the privateers, especially in the first few years when there wasn't time to go out and build one. But as privateering took off and became a little bit more uh, financially uh, profitable for certain deep pocketed individuals like uh, Derby, Elias Haskett Derby of Salem, they actually built privateers like the Grand Turk, which is a 300 ton vessel that had more than 30 cannons on it. So that was a purpose built privateer. I can't tell you the act, actual percentage of those that were purpose built. My guess would be that it was fewer than, far fewer than 20%. Uh, there were a lot of vessels in, uh, in the colonies. And also a lot of the privateers and merchant vessels that the Americans captured that were British were turned into privateers. So they were turned around. In fact, it was very common to see these ads. You know, the so-and-so British ship was just captured. It's, it's finally made out to be a great privateer, come to the auction and bid on it. So it was, uh, it was sort of a compilation of a number of ways in which they uh, came up with their, their privateers. But boy, did they have a lot of guts to go out in the ocean. I mean, people, even before the American Revolution, when there was no war, to get in a vessel in the late 1700s and go into the Atlantic Ocean when, uh, um, you know, it was before the Blunt Brothers and, you know, maps and maps of local ports were not very good. They didn't have GPS. They didn't have the weather service and the weather channel. They didn't know whether a storm was coming. And then you throw into the mix the fact that you might come up against a British warship or even a British merchant ship, some of which were very heavily armed during the war. It was, and then to, to top it off, you're on a boat that's maybe 80 feet long and there are a hundred other guys on the boat. It's cramped conditions, lousy food. I mean, it took a lot of, a lot of guts 
to do that. And I often have wondered if I was alive during the American Revolution, would I have fought for my country? I like to think that I would have. I don't know which branch I would have gone into, but I've got to tell you, it is so much easier being a writer. <laughs> Yeah, hi, I want to yeah. ask you about the prospects for a young man, let's say age 25. Okay. And uh, what you just said, I had thought of the question beforehand, but I think you may have thought about this writing the book. So what are the prospects for somebody age 25, living in Portsmouth, making a choice between, should I join the British Navy? Should I stay in the okay. farm? Should I join as a privateer? They probably didn't spend a lot of time thinking about the downsides, yes. but do you have any insight into what are the prospects of returning home wealthy or in a casket? Uh, well, if they realistically assess their likely future, I think far fewer people would have become privateersmen because as I mentioned, uh, more than 10,000 easily died in prison. Uh, many others uh, did not come back wealthy. Privateering was sort of like piracy in the sense that it's like going into a casino and you always think you're going to win, but most people are going to lose. And I do not believe privateers were li licensed pirates. I think they're very different. If you want to read about real pirates, I wrote a book called Black Flags, Blue Waters, but there's a big distinction. However, what I think drew many men, and many of them younger than 25, uh, to leave their farms, because a lot of them are green hands and a lot of them were sailors, is a combination of they wanted to fight for their country, but they also heard the stories about the Congress and the chants, two of the first privateers to come out of Philadelphia that came back with tens of thousands of dollars worth of specie, which they kindly handed over to the Continental Congress, which was in need of money. But still, that sort of lit up the eyes, just like pirates who would read about Captain Henry Avery, the pirate who got away with a fortune and melted into the, the, the dark recesses of history. Most pirates ended up at the end of a gallows or poor. It was a miserable, short, brutish life, uh, to quote Hobbes. So, and privateersmen, many of them, um, were not successful, but enough were, and there were enough winning voyages. And what Robert Morris, the financier of the revolution said, and keep in mind, he was an owner, not a privateersman. He said, you need to continually be sending out your ships because one success can cover three or four failures. Now, if you're a, a sailor on one of those failed ships, you don't have the same attitude, but there's a lot of truth to that math. So realistically, a lot of privateersmen had a horrible end or did not make a lot of money. But when you're young and your prospects on land are maybe a boring, stultifying labor job or no job at all, because a lot of, uh, a lot of commerce died understandably during the American Revolution, you might decide to take your chance on a privateer. And uh, you know, the, the advertisements looked very exciting, the thought of going to sea. I mean, pirates, it just amazes me when I think about the second era of piracy, the golden age was sort of from the late 1600s to the 1720s, but the second era that everybody focuses on, and I was interviewed this morning for a podcast about this, so it's on my mind, was, the Johnny Depp era, for lack of a better word, the Pirates of the Caribbean era, the Blackbeard, the Sam, you know, the Sam Bellamy, the Witta. Well, during that era, the vast majority of pirates, including most of Blackbeard's men, came away with nothing and, and were killed. It was a miserable time to become a pirate. But there are a lot of people who look how many people we have that are how many people rob banks or rob people or do illegal acts today. On balance, I think it's a pretty bad bet to uh, break the law, but people, there's never a shortage of people who are willing to do it. And uh, I'm not trying to make a parallel again for privateering, but I think that the, think about it, if you were 19 or 20 and you, were, you didn't have a great job or, and you, hurt, you wanted to fight for your country, you didn't want to go into the Navy, you didn't want to go into the Army, privateering might look very attractive. And of course, whenever you got on the ship, you thought just like a whaling person. I wrote a book about whaling. When they started out their voyages, they thought they were gonna have a greasy trip. They didn't think they were gonna spend five years at sea and come back with nothing and earn 10 cents. 
if they if they could see their future, they wouldn't have gotten on board probably. But then again, a lot of them had miserable lives on shore. I mean, the average person in the early 17 in the mid 1700s during the American Revolution, right before it, the lower down, the lower rungs of society that made up the bulk of privateersmen, their lives were not so rosy. Despite the fact that on the eve of the American Revolution, the American colonies had the highest standard of living in the Western world. And I, that's actually, I think, part of the reason that contributed to the start of the American Revolution. But uh, everybody didn't benefit from it. Just like today, everybody doesn't benefit from our great wealth. There's a wide disparity. So if you're on the lower echelons and you don't see very attractive prospects, privateering might have looked uh, quite good. We have a question online. Eileen is curious to know more about James Fortin and if he ever interacted with any of the founding fathers. Huh, well here I'm gonna plead a little bit of ignorance because one, there's a great book written about him by, oh shoot, what is her name? Julie, Julie Winch, I think. I'm probably screwing it up. But uh, she wrote an entire book. She works, at, she's a professor at UMass Boston. So look it up, it's about, James Fortin book came out in recent years. She, if you look at that book, you will learn all about what he did after the American Revolution. I know some of what he did after the American Revolution. I don't know all of it. I couldn't recite to you a list of the founding fathers or illustrious personages that he interacted with. I would be surprised if he didn't have interactions with quite a few of them, certainly the people that were high up in business echelons. But uh, one of the byproducts of being somebody like me who's writing history who doesn't have an enormous well of you know i didn't go to school for 20 years studying history is that when i work on a book i focus like a laser on every resource that's going to help me tell my story if it's outside the ambit of my story unless i happen to read about it some other time i don't i don't know about it and i always get frustrated and this happens a lot people will ask me, what books do you read for fun? Now, I'm a kind of a fun guy, but <laughs> I don't read for fun because I have to come up to speed on these topics, which are very complicated. Almost every single book that I read while I'm working on a book is related to the book I'm working on at that moment. I can't remember the last time I read a book of fiction and reading a book of nonfiction that isn't related to what I'm working on, the only books I tend to read are ones that I blurb. So, you know, I'm not as widely read as Peter Drummy, <laughs> who is, a, who is a, a Renaissance man. <laughs> Few of us are as widely read as Peter Drummy. Um, I, I would like to thank everyone for joining us, both online and in person. Uh, we'll have books for sale. Uh, and please join me in thanking. Uh,